Tamua wants more graphs of functions by Jacqueline Tyler. Uh, some really nice questions in here. I enjoyed doing this one. I think I only got one more to do after this, which I'll try and get done this week. So uh, there's going to be a lot of completing the square in this. Uh, we're going to complete the square on this thing here to find its turning point. Uh, always take away the square of the thing inside, of course. Tidy it up so the turning point is 5 over 2, 3 over 4. And then this is being moved 2 to the right here. So you add 2 to this, which gets you to 9 over 2. Uh, three quarters and then you add those two things up that's 18 over 4 right so it makes 21 over 4 which will be our answer yeah there's lots of that um so we're symmetrical around the x-axis um if any positive y value that we substitute in gives us the same as its negative counterpart so for example if you sub in positive 1 as y then that's going to be the same thing as if you sub in minus 1 as y. And we can see because both y's are to even powers, that's going to be the case here. So this is um, symmetrical around the x-axis. The uh, symmetricalness around, or symmetry around the y-axis is exactly the same deal except for x's. Except you can tell here, if you sub in x is 1, that's going to get you something different to if you sub in x is minus 1 because of the odd powers. So this is going to be symmetrical around the x-axis, but not the y-axis will be our answer. Next one here, we just need to draw these. Um, so if we complete the square on this one, we notice that it turns out quite nicely here. We draw the graph. This has a turning point at 91, I guess. Sorry, 90 minus 1, of course. Now, sine squared looks a bit like the sine graph, except everywhere it's negative, it just needs to go positive. It's going to bend a little bit differently outside of that, but it's essentially the same graph. So this is just the sine graph doing this. And then instead of going this, it just goes positive again, because, of course, negative squared positives. Its maximum is still 1, because 1 squared is still 1. This shouldn't go down here, but I just drew the graph badly. You get the idea. Um, 90 minus 1 is our turning point here, so that's down here somewhere, because, of course, this is 90 here. And uh, you can see when you put in x is, um, is 0, you're going to get 90 squared minus 1, which is way up here somewhere. So the y-intercept should be way up here somewhere, like way off the screen. But in, it doesn't really matter. We'll just be able to see that we get two solutions either way, um, as long as you recognize it's by far and away tall enough to avoid hitting this peak again anywhere which it definitely is, then you should be fine. How many regions are there here? So we're going to draw them. So that's the x squared graph. This has a, um, you could do this a couple of ways. It roots at 0 and 3, I guess you could say. Um, and then turning point is clearly going to be 1 and a half something. If you complete the square, you find out it's minus 9 over 4. So that's down here somewhere, roots at 0 and 3. So it connects there at 0, 0. And then this one, similar thing, right? Complete the square. Um, because in this case, there are no roots. Turning point at minus 3 over 2. So over here somewhere, and then a positive 1 up there. And you get this. Now it's just a case of counting the regions. Um, and uh, you just need to think, like, does this curve here ever hit this curve here, ever hit this curve here kind of thing? Well, because they're all the same coefficient of x squared, they're all kind of not parallel, but kind of curvy parallel. And so one is never going to catch up to the other one. You can also verify that maybe if you look for solutions between these two graphs, the only one you're going to find is x equals 0, which is the one we've really got. So they never intersect again. And then we just count regions, right? The big one outside, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. I think will be our total answer. Kind of a cool question here, and um, pick the graph. Um, we can see that there's going to be an asymptote at y equals x, which I'm seeing in these two graphs. This one has an asymptote at y equals minus x, um, and this one doesn't seem to really have much going on at all. The reason there's an asymptote at y equals x is because if you make y equal to x, you end up with x minus x, which was 0 here, and you have something times 0 equals 1, which we know can't happen. So there must be an asymptote at y equals x, so we're down to either a or c. And then think about the difference you see between a and c. Well, on the positive x side, this one always seems to have two solutions to y. And this one sometimes has two solutions to y, but also actually has a gap in the middle. So, so maybe that's trying that gap. If you just put an x equals 1, maybe, um, you'll see that y ends up being quadratic, which you can't solve. And so therefore has no solutions for y. b squared minus 4 c is less than 0 there. Um, and so the answer must be a, because we, we've, we've identified that this gap does actually exist in the middle there. Another drawing one, so cos squared, um, again, looks a bit like the regular cos graph, except uh, obviously, so it starts at 1, comes down, but then goes back up again because something squared is always positive. Uh, it's going to be a bit more bendy than the cos graph. All these peaks are supposed to be the same height at 1, but drawing these things in PowerPoint is hard. It's going to do the same thing on the other side. And this is 90, 180, 270, 360, although we're probably working in radians here, right, because it doesn't say otherwise. Um, so pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi here, and then it just does the same thing both sides. X cubed is clearly just a, a cubic graph that does this kind of business. It goes up, uh, inflects, and then up again. At pi over 2, pi over 2 cubed, well, pi over 2 is like 1.5. So cubing that, and it's something significantly bigger than 1. 
So it's not going to be so flat that it goes over here and insects loads of times. It's just going to go straight up and pass this graph quite quickly. And it ends up being a very steep curve. Obviously, no insections down here. But it flex there and then just goes up very steeply. And so there's only going to be one intersection somewhere in there. Uh, we can once again complete the square on this object here. Uh, and then um, we can say that the, this plus 3 is the same as timesing by 2 to the power of 3. Because you would add the powers if you do this. So that's eight slots of the original function moved one to the uh, left, I guess. Um, so yeah, this is a transition parallel to the x. Sorry, translation translation parallel to the x-axis, followed by a stretch, which is this eight um, parallel to the y-axis. I think will be fine to say. I don't think it actually matters which order you do those two things either. So so yeah, all good to go. Next one here, we've got um, a function that has two roots, so it could look a bit like this, I guess. Consider these graphs, which these definitely also has two roots. Moving the function down three places, this is a good counterexample here. If this if this turning point up here was, you know, only at one, then moving the function down three places would give you no roots anymore. You'd remove both of them, so this one doesn't do it. Moving the function left or right by three places is obviously not going to change the number of roots the function has because they'll just move three places to the right or left. So that's absolutely fine. We'll, we'll keep this one going. This one is a stretch parallel to the y-axis, so the whole thing gets taller. But like the two roots are essentially at y equals 0. So when you stretch those factor 3, they're still at y equals 0, i.e. they're still roots. And so it's still going to have two roots. This one here, you would flip the graph over um, and then move it up three places. So if we imagine maybe flipping this graph, because um, I didn't draw it apparently, you're going to have to do it on our heads. If you imagine um, flipping this graph, uh, upside down like this is going to be a, a normal u-shaped quadratic when you move that up three places going to have the exact opposite situation you did here which is you might move it too high to therefore have roots and so this goes away for the same reason and this is just a reflection in the x-axis it's also a stretch but we've already argued that stretches don't matter because zero times zero is still zero i guess although that's not actually what's going on here but it doesn't matter either way you you flip the graph over in the y-axis you're still gonna have two roots and then you stretch them you know, whether it's away from the y-axis or towards, it's not going to matter. They're still going to exist. So it will definitely still have two roots. So three of them, I think, still have two roots. Uh, next one here, um, again, a pick the graph question. Uh, just sub in y equals 0 or x equals 0 and both and just check. So if x equals 0, you get y is plus or minus 2. The only graph that's knocked out by that is this one here because it doesn't have a y equals plus 2 thing at 0. Then you put in y equals 0 and you get this, which doesn't have any roots because you'd need x squared equals minus 4. So basically, when at y is 0, so when you're on the x-axis, um, you don't have any solutions for x. And the only graph that obeys that is a, so therefore the answer will be a. Question 10, um, we've got a quadratic here that's reflected, uh, and uh, apparently the translation is the same as the reflection. So let's just um, firstly complete the square on this. Now, it's a minus x squared term, so I, I pulled out a minus from the x squared and the x term like this, then complete the square, then put the minus back in to get a turning point of b over 2 and this, and the graph is also upside down. So it looks a bit like this, I guess. When it's reflected in the y-axis, the only thing that changes here is this b over 2 changes to a minus b over 2, and then otherwise the thing's the same. And then apparently that's the same graph as when you move this three units left. So therefore, the difference between b over 2 and minus b over 2 must be 3, and because that distance must be 3 there to make it the same graph. So b over 2 minus, minus b over 2 equals 3, and you can get b is 3 pretty quickly from there, just because it ends up just being b equals 3 when you do that properly. Um, okay, one more time here. We'll just put in x equals 0 to find out how, what happens on the y-axis, and then um, maybe y equals 0 to find out what happens with the x, although I'm not actually sure that's what I do here. Anyway, x equals 0 means um, 1 minus the mod of 1, which is just 1 minus 1, which is uh, 0. So y is 0, so we'll knock out graph a. Everything else goes through 0, 0, so that's fine. I'm next going to, you always want to think about, like, what is the actual identifying difference between these three pictures? I could have subbed in y equals 0, and I think I could have solved that for x. So you get a couple of different things based on some plus minuses. But actually, one way of knocking these out is just to think, what happens as x gets really, really big, right? 1 minus a really, really big number is minus a really, really big number. But then you mod it to get plus that really, really big number. And then you end up with 1 minus that, which is, of course, some massive negative number. So... As x gets really, really big, your graph is going to get y really, really, really big and small. And the only graph that does that is c. The other two graphs head upwards. So c must just be the answer um, just by uh, doing that. 
Question 12, the hardest question on here, I thought. And um, basically, you're, you've got some function here. This is not what this function looks like, I don't think, really, but it doesn't matter. You've got some function that has a range of all the real numbers. So essentially, it's a function that spans the entire y-axis. Like, it, it just has a, a value for every single um, value you could put on this axis. It spans the entire thing going upwards. So basically, if we just pick some c that exists on the y-axis somewhere, not specifying anything about c, we must have the case that c equals that for some value of x. Um, and basically, we're just going to decide what the values of k are such that this is always true for some value of x, right? That way, it always does span the entire y-axis. So if we multiply across here and then tidy up, we get this. Um, I should have said this equals zero here, sorry, because the next step, of course, is I'm saying that for this to always have solutions, I want this to always have solutions for no matter what x. That's the entire point, is no matter what x I pick, I should always get solutions out of this because there's because I'm always somewhere on, the, uh, I, I, there's, there's no gaps, right? The graph doesn't head downwards. There's no C value that doesn't give solutions here. So basically, this should equal zero, but the next step is for b squared minus 4ac needs to be greater than. So I think I just copied the wrong slide here, but, and I just put this, this in by mistake. Um, so yeah, this is b squared minus 4ac needs to be greater than zero. So we'll sort that out. That removes the x's, which is good, and we get down to here. Um, and now this is a quadratic in C, um, and I need it to always be greater or equal to zero. So basically, it's it's also, um, if, if the coefficient of c squared is negative, then you're going to get an upside down quadratic, which is you can't have upside down quadratics that are always bigger or equal to zero. So this has to be positive, firstly, so I can I can solve that b has to be this. But also, um, if I've got that I've got a positive quadratic now, so k is this. This is one condition that I need to meet. If I've got a positive quadratic now, I need it to have no roots. Otherwise, it's going to not be. Or I guess it could have one root. I guess because it could equal zero. Um, so maybe I'm playing fast and loose with this. Um, yeah, I am. This should be less than or equal to zero because I, I am allowing it to have at least one root here, aren't I? So this should be less than or equal to zero. Apologies. Um, but I just need b squared minus 4ac to be less than zero because I don't want it to have any, I don't know, or less than or equal to, I don't want it to have two roots, right? I don't want it to be, go below the axis at any point because then the entire quadratic would be negative. So b squared minus 4ac less than or equal to zero is what I should have wrote here. So apologies for this sign here being wrong. And, uh, and sorry, this one here is wrong, isn't it? And this one here should be less than or equal to. Just some bad typing on my part. And um, when you expand all that out, um, you end up with this, which turns into this, which you can factorize out and divide by uh, 16. And you end up with k is, is 0 or 5, so it's going to be the less than or equal to, because remember, these should all be equal to's as well. And you end up with c as your answer. Probably the hardest thing on there, for sure. Um, yeah, didn't really, didn't really rate that question. It took me a while to figure out. Um, I also thought maybe there was some way of just... Uh, because what you really want is you just want asymptotes to the graph. So there's probably some way of figuring this out just by saying, well, this has as vertical asymptotes wherever this denominator is zero. So you could just do a discriminant check here um, to make sure you get asymptotes. But then how do you know the graph doesn't head downwards both ways? Um, like, because an asymptote is great if it goes downwards one way and then from the top the other, like the tan graph, that would immediately give you a range of everything. But I couldn't think of an easy way of checking whether the graph went down, down both ways or down up, which is the case you want. So this is the only other way that I thought, and it's a quite a, kind of a long-winded way, but um, yeah, sure. Someone can write in the comments how we're supposed to fix that other method, because I'm sure there is a way of making it work. Anyway, this graph clearly has an asymptote at x equals minus four, because you can't divide by zero. Now there are other asymptotes uh, to that, so it's either a, b, or c, right? These two have other asymptotes. So just ask yourself, what happens if you put y equals x minus one in? After you make y this graph, just put y equals x minus 1 in, cross multiply, and all the x's end up cancelling, right? So you end up with not 0, but minus 4 equals 2. What was I even doing when I was typing this? I I think I was very tired. This should obviously have a minus 4 uh, here, for obvious reasons. But minus 4 still doesn't equal, uh, equal to 2, so this is still wrong. So therefore the asymptote does exist at y equals x minus 1, and the answer is b. Let's hope that there's no more stupid stuff written here, though there almost certainly is. Uh, quadratic form, form, sorry, quadratic function has maximum at 3, 5. Uh, so it looks a bit like this, I guess, as a maximum, so it's an upside down quadratic. Um, we have a, that it's being transformed onto uh, to the graph g of x. So the minimum point is now the origin. And now notice the minimum point. So the first thing we have to do is turn this graph upside down, um, which will involve using minus f of x, of course. And then we need that minus f of x to get over here. 
So we need to move it up five places because currently this point is at three minus five. So it needs to go up five places. So that's one of these plus fives. And it also needs to go to the left three places. So that will be an X um, plus three um, to make it go left three places. And so our answer will be B uh, to that question. Uh, 15, just to spot the graph question. Um, so sine squared, as we saw before, it's something squared, right? So it's always positive. So that graph is immediately wiped out. If we look for roots of this graph, um, we can square root zero to still get zero. And then when you sign inverse of zero, you of course get zero or pi or two pi or three pi or so on. But then when you square all of those to get your X, you're gonna get zero or pi or four pi or nine pi. So the roots are getting further and further apart. So it's not D, it's either one of um, B or C where the roots are clearly getting further apart. But there's no reason for this maximal point to change because uh, sine squared, you know, it has a sine has a maximum of one. So sine squared still has a maximum of one because one squared is still one. So the answer must be B because those those maximal points are not going to be changing. Um, and so the answer must be B. Very similar for question 16. Um, two to the minus X is always positive. And this is something squared. It's sine of X squared or squared. So both of these things are always positive, which means B is wiped out because it has negative sections. If we look for roots, just the same as we did before, set y to be zero. This is always positive, it's never zero, right? So we're looking for sine of x squared to equal zero. Um, square root, of course, zero is still zero. Um, and then if we do the same thing, sine is zero, zero, two pi, three pi, and so on. Um, and then square roots, we end up with a bunch of roots that are kind of getting closer and closer to each other because this is essentially root one pi, root two pi, root three pi, root four pi, root five pi, root six pi, and so on. And those roots are getting closer and closer. And you know that um, because take, for example, between three and four, that's between root nine and root 16. There'll be like seven roots, root nine, root 10, root 11, root 12, and so on. Um, whereas between like two and three, there's only gonna be five roots, but from root four, root two, root five, root six, root seven, and root eight, and root nine, and so on. So the roots are getting closer and closer together. Um, so um, we can't have C because those roots look like they're roughly the same distance apart every single time. Um, so it's got to be A or D. Um, what's the defining difference between these graphs? Well, one of them starts up here and one of them starts at zero. So just plug in X equals zero. And uh, if you plug in X equals zero, you get two to the minus zero, which is one. But then sine of zero is always zero. So um, we're going to start at zero and the answer will be A. And the very last one um, is just going to be dealing with this quadratic here, I think is the, the, main, the, main, the main thing to do here. Um, let's try and solve that quadratic for zero. Um, of course, as soon as we think about doing that, we notice the quadratic has a negative discriminant, so therefore it never equals zero. Um, so that's cool, um, because what that means is you're not ever inputting a negative into your log. So this doesn't have any asymptotes or anything like that. So C and D are gone, um, because you're not going to do log to base 10 of zero ever, or log to base 10 of a negative. So that's that's just all gone there. That doesn't That doesn't happen. The, the, so this quadratic is always positive, so that's cool. So the graph does exist everywhere. Now, when would this graph get to zero? Well, it's if you were doing log of one, like if you're doing log to base 10 of one, then that equals zero because anything to the power zero is one. Um, so these two things that get to zero are suggesting that the quadratic could equal one at some point. Um, so let's just um, say that, in other words, that's a super complicated way of me just saying, what happens when you put in y is zero? Like. Does the graph not exist or does it have a root somewhere? Um, so if you put in y is zero, um, you end up with obviously raising both sides to the power 10 and uh, you get this. And then uh, you take away one from both sides and you solve for x equals one, right? Because it's x minus one all squared. Um, so it is this graph here, right? There's a double root at one and uh, e will be your answer. And that's the whole paper. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.